You can have conversations with lots of other people and you never end up confused. But with that one person, you're always confused is because they're manipulating and they're avoiding responsibility. So one of the key components of abuse is the person who's harming you is avoiding responsibility for their actions. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Patrick Doyle Show. I'm Patrick Doyle, and uh, I'm glad you're here. Today, we're going to be talking about emotional abuse. And with me today is Amber Lynn. She is the Community Relations Director at Pathway to Hope, which is an online membership program uh, that we founded about a year and a half, almost two years ago in December. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I felt it necessary to found such a thing is I saw the profound need for women to have support, not mm -hmm. just information, but community. Because one of the difficulties of emotional abuse or toxic relationships or being in a relationship with a narcissist or whichever way you want to frame it, or you're being harmed in a relationship over a long period of time, one of the major problems is having someone in your life that understands that process and is not going to judge you or try to get you to stay or uh, manipulate you because it makes them uncomfortable, <laughs> any of that. So what I found with Pathway to Hope is that it's a safe community. And Amber, you're a big part of that because you know you do manage the community and you see all kinds of things that go on. You see all the stories as much as I do. And so I just felt like it'd be really good to have a discussion about emotional abuse from the from people who understand it in a deep and profound way and take some of the questions and comments that we've heard from YouTube, email all over the place and Pathway to Hope. Um, and let's just talk about it, because I think that these things being talked about, um, like I've seen with previous YouTube videos I've done, really makes an impact for people to be able to get the information and go oh wow you just said something that i felt but i didn't really know how to articulate it and oh you put a word to what i was feeling or that described what i've been experiencing so i just think it's very viable so i appreciate being with me today amber and um from your perspective what, what kind of questions or what kind of things do you think we need to go over today yeah, I think, you know, for myself and my own story with emotional abuse and what I've seen in the stories of many others, and that includes men and women, yes. is it's really hard. You kind of go through this journey or this uh, process of trying to figure out, is this really emotional abuse? Mm -hmm. And you're yes. constantly like questioning yourself. And, um, and so I think is going over like some major signs and symptoms okay. mm -hmm. that you've seen over the years. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, just having a conversation about that. So, okay, good. So yeah. um, I would say one of the number one signs I hear from women, this is one of the number one things I hear women say, mm -hmm. I feel crazy. Mm -hmm. And um, if you feel that way, the reason why is women feel crazy or actually it doesn't matter what relationship you're in, whether it's your parent, your child, your, your coworker, your boss, your co it does not matter. If you feel crazy in a relationship, it's generally 99% of the time. It's because the person you're in the relationship with never takes responsibility for any of their actions mm -hmm. rather than take responsibility. They blame shift. They rationalize, they minimize, they justify, they deny, they gaslight, they do whatever they can to avoid responsibility and put it back on you. And so what I see with, with, with folks is that they're just like, well, I'm pretty sure that was what happened. And then I talked to them and then doo -doo -doo -doo, now I don't know. And I'm just, maybe it was me and I don't know, I'm kind of confused. And so the other thing I say all the time to folks is like, listen, if you're regularly confused in a in a particular relationship it's because you're being manipulated yeah you can have conversations with lots of other people and you never end up confused but with that one person you're always confused is because they're manipulating and they're avoiding responsibility so one of the key components of abuse is the person who's harming you is avoiding responsibility for their actions <laughs> one of the things i see a lot though with people uh, who are abusers, who are toxic, who are narcissists, whatever word you want to put on it, is this, is they do the acknowledgement uh, apology. So the person that they're with 
confronts them about something and they say, oh yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I did that. Right. But if you hadn't, I wouldn't have needed to, but if you, because, so they acknowledge the event. And so the person who's coming to them goes, oh yeah, they get it. No, no, they don't. Because acknowledgement is a very different thing than ownership. Mm -hmm. I can acknowledge something and take no ownership of it. Yeah, I did that, but it's not my fault. Yeah. And so it, all these things are very nuanced. And this is the difficulty in emotionally abusive relationships, toxic relationships, is because the abuser is very, very subtle mm -hmm. and very manipulative and will lie and be convincing. And vast majority of these people also are well respected by other people. They have a good look good. So yeah. it really makes the person in the relationship with them doubt themselves. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. I, maybe, maybe it's me. And so that's the other sign is that you can never get any resolution and you feel like the problem. Yes. There's so can we go back for just a second? When you yeah. were talking about those examples of when someone's giving an apology, there was a common word that I saw in every one of those sentences that you're saying is the word, but. Yes. Can we talk a little bit about what does that mean <laughs> in so, these kind of dynamics? I have a saying, uh, a definition of what, when someone says, but mm -hmm. what they're saying is, um, when they say, but as they're saying, forget everything I just said, now I'm going to tell you what I really think. Okay. So yada, 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 but then they tell you what they really think. Oh yeah, I understand. I did that. And that wasn't very nice. No, no, no. But if you hadn't, so that's really the truth. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, the, yeah, my, my other saying is, you know, with ownership, there is no buts. Mm-hmm. If somebody's using a lot of buts and explanations and excuses, they're falsely apologizing. Or the other thing I see a lot is what I call the apology blame shift. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, uh, I'm sorry I did that, but you need it because and if you hadn't because and then no, 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 no. And so you don't ever get any, ultimately you never get any resolution to an issue. Yeah. And so what I see with ladies a lot is psychologically, Internally, their gut is screaming for years. Mm. There's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem. And they try every angle, which way they can to try to get that person to own it. But that person just won't. They yeah. can't. They're unable. They're unwilling, whatever. So what happens with women is there that constant level of emotional stress. They start to lose their hair. They have chronic fatigue syndrome. They're their cortisol levels are shot, you know, their adrenals are shot, they're, they feel exhausted, they're overwhelmed, they have no internal peace. And that's all because you're with someone who will never own a thing. Now, in a healthy relationship, any, any relationship is going to have conflict. The difference between a healthy relationship that moves forward and builds trust and deepens trust is a relationship where you can bring a problem to the table and two people own their parts mm -hmm. and then they come to a deeper connection. And so that difficulty actually makes their relationship and their bond and their intimacy and their trust stronger. Yeah. But mm -hmm. when you're with someone who never owns anything and listen, as the person who's being harmed or has the question, you get to decide if they own it, not them. And this is the other thing in uh, abusive relationships, emotionally abusive relationships, is the other person's always telling you your perception is wrong. That's mm -hmm. the essence of gaslighting. Mm -hmm. What you perceive is wrong. And so I teach it all the time. You have to pay attention to your instincts, your gut, your spirit. If you don't, that person will maintain much higher levels of control. Mm -hmm. Wow. So what I'm hearing you say is in emotional abuse, um, most of the time, if not all the time, the one doing the harm does not accept any kind of responsibility, or if they do, it's very secondary to trying to defend themselves. Correct. So Correct. it's like, sure. Okay. I'm sorry, but yeah, you know. yeah really it ultimately ends up being your, your fault again. And then ultimately you're the problem. Right. And, <laughs> and then as a result of that, you're taking on or taking on that responsibility and there's been physical effects of that yes. over time like you yes. said depression there always will be yeah. hair yeah fibromyalgia exhaustion exhaustion so think about think about it this way 
you go out to your car, you start it up, you leave it in park and you take your foot and you smash it, the accelerator to the floor and you leave it there for an hour. Mm -hmm. If your car doesn't blow up within that time, have you shortened the life of the engine? Well, the answer is yes, because you're not, your car's not designed to be run that way and neither are you. And this is what's happening is you're living with so much stress internally and on the outside, you're like this, but inside you're stressed out. And the other thing I see all the time, I did it myself. You protect the abuser. Right. You make it look good. You lie for them. You cover for them. And and so that's also part of the problem because then everybody's like, what? I thought everything was fine. I thought blah, blah, blah. he's such a nice guy, blah, blah, blah. And so then there's all of that internal stress. Like, you know, when I start coming to the conclusion that, oh, no, there's really, really bigger problems than I thought. Now I'm complicit because I've been covering it up. So then other people around me don't believe me. And in the church, this is epidemic Mm -hmm. where the church wants you to go back into that relationship and work harder, try harder, have more sex, make, make better meals, be nicer, you know, and then if you, if you're just nice enough, he'll come around, which is never true. Mm -hmm. That is a very unfortunate lie that the church keeps propagating. It's not true. If someone's harming you, the most loving thing you can do is stop them. Mm -hmm. And listen, you get to decide what harm is. And this goes back to my definition of of emotional abuse. Go online. There's lots of definitions. There's lots of information to tell you what it looks like. But ultimately, here's what I would say. Do you feel harmed? That's the main thing. Mm -hmm. If a woman comes to me and she says, I feel harmed, okay. I take you at your word. I believe you. And then we're going to investigate. And then we'll either find out that it's absolutely true or we won't. But if somebody comes to you and says, I feel harmed, and you instantly put them away and say, oh, no, that can't be. That person can never do that. Mm -hmm. No. And I have sat in my office as a counselor for years talking to very successful, very Christian leaders, pastors, elders. And I know for a fact that many of them are the most horrible people I've ever met. Mm-hmm. because they're duplicitous at a very high level on the public image. They're fantastic behind closed doors. They're terrible people. Yes. So what I, what I don't suffer from is the delusion that someone could not be harmful. <laughs> Anybody could be. So we have to, we have to believe and investigate. I got you. So a Jesus fish on the back of the car doesn't <laughs> give you an exception. <laughs> well, even if you're, business <laughs> truck. <laughs> right. Well, if you're the worship leader or you're the, the star pastor or you're the, you're the guy on the TV, the radio, doesn't matter. I mean, yeah. case in point, Ravi Zacharias. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if someone comes to me and says they like, I, I, I can I can confess to this that years ago when I was a pastor, year, many years ago, I would have been the guy that would have tried to push you back into it. I didn't understand it. Mm-hmm. Now I do. And I understand the horror of that advice because I've given it <laughs> and I've seen the outcome of that not be good. Yes. So, you know, someone's uh, if a wo- if a woman comes to me and she says, hey, this is difficulties happening in my marriage. Which person's going to come do that because they want to draw attention to themselves and mess up their lives? I heard lots of pastors say, well, what are you trying to do here? I'm like, why would somebody expose themselves and put themselves in harm's way because they have some sort of weird agenda? That's just a smokescreen to avoid the issue of the person who's harming them. Mm -hmm. And the church has a way of protecting abusers. Mm -hmm. Because they don't want to get involved in the very messy, nitty gritty, long term difficulty that it is to help someone in this situation, which is why I created PTH, because we need a safe place. Yeah. So one of the symptoms that I experience and I also hear quite um, frequently from other women is the sense of feeling like you just totally lost yourself. You don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering why that is from your perspective. Because the person that you're with is destroying your will to live. I mean, think about being responsible for everything. Yeah, that almost becomes your identity then. You're the problem. There's something wrong with me. Right. And so, and so subsequently, they're all at that same time, what they're doing 
with their denial and manipulation through all the tactics of all the things I've listed, you know, rationalize, minimize, justify, spiritualize, deny, guess, all those things. What they're doing is they're telling you that you don't matter mm -hmm. and that you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, if you believe you don't matter, how difficult is life going to be? And you don't matter. That message is being sent to you from the person in your life who's supposed to love you the most. Mm -hmm. Now, let's take somebody like me who had that message from their childhood. Mm -hmm. So I was very susceptible to that because I already believed it. Yeah. Uh, but I don't believe this is the message of the creator to us is that we're worthless. No, I think that's a tragic theological error that we've made. I've made that, you know, people are worthless and God, you know, is upset with them. No, God didn't create worthless. That's not, that's not how it worked. So you have this person undermining your value, blaming you for everything. So the weight of everything just gets so heavy. And in that process, the person you are has to die. Otherwise you won't stay. Mm -hmm. So you have to rationalize, minimize, justify, justify and build your own. Every single one of us has to build a denial structure to survive abuse. Mm -hmm. So we have to start checking out. Well, I don't know, maybe because and I shouldn't. And, and, and you start, you start, you know, tainting what reality is and turning it into something else so you can live with it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In my upcoming book, I talk about this. I have a chapter about it. it's called Hopium. You know, we keep taking shots of hopium, giving the benefit of the doubt, you know, rationalize, minimize, justifying, whatever the situation, because I'd rather take the shot of hopium then deal with the grief of the reality of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when we get to the place where we can really experience the grief and listen, I have no judgment for anybody who's injecting the opium. I did it for years. Right. Yeah. It's just part of the process. But once we get to the place where we start to see it for what it is, and this is why I so strongly encourage women to document what's happening to them. So in a day or a week or a month, they can look at that and go, oh, wow, mm -hmm. that's not, oh, okay. So they start to get that clarity. And as clarity comes up, grief comes with it because you start to see the horror of what it is mm -hmm. this is where real change happens at that point when you start confronting and putting boundaries up in a really significant way that relationship is either going to change for the better or you're going to get out of it those are the two doors and so none of us want that <laughs> we all want the guaranteed outcome of if we have this conversation it all turns out and works out and we're going to live happily ever after i wish that were the case but i've talked to thousands of people I don't know why people won't repent. I don't know why people won't. I mean, we could speculate all day long, but I don't really care about that. What I care about is the fact that they're not. And there's a long term pattern of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so the other thing I talk about is the, the idea of percentages. Like if somebody you're living in a relationship and it's really good 10 percent of the time but it's really bad 90% of the time, well, what we tend to do is we tend to live in the 10%. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I'll just live on the shots of hopium until I get to that next 10% moment. But I'm here to tell you that is a, a, a for sure way to live in a unhealthy, emotionally distressed, devalued, disregarded state. And I want you to confront it and help that person come to clarity or when you realize they won't get away so you don't die in the process. Yeah. And, you know, um, clarity is, is hard to hold on to because of the grief. I see the clarity and I'm like, oh, wow. And then the grief comes and I'm like, another shot of hopium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I see it again. And so this is why, like, the, the community at Pathway to Hope is so important because other people who have similar experiences can validate what you're feeling and thinking and what you're experiencing instead of trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no, there's no, and there's no quick fix here. This is a process. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I have seen some very horrible things done by very supposedly good men. Yes, you have. So I don't have the delusion that because somebody says they're a good man is, you, you, you know, like I talk about it all the time, you know, I'm from Missouri now, <laughs> the show me state, you know, you got to show me, I don't really care what you say. And this is the other thing I try to teach people in relationships is like, look, if someone's behavior is showing you that they don't care, believe it. Yeah. Don't keep trying to make it be something else. Right. 
And that's how you, you, so you have the choice of staying in the harmful relationship and slowly, I call it the death of a thousand cuts, just slowly dying from a thousand cuts. And this is the other problem with emotional abuse. And that's why I use that saying, because if you showed somebody one cut, they'd go, oh, it's not that big a deal. And true, probably not. When you show somebody a thousand and the person's bleeding to death and they have all these cuts all over them, you're like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Exactly. So if somebody walks in with a black eye, that's easy. Oh, that person hit you. There's, you, can't, <laughs> you can't deny that when there's the black eye. Right. Right. So I, I was dealing with somebody, I don't know, must have been two or three, four months ago. And uh, the person, the, this daughter, 18, had a video of their dad slapping them. So video was showed to the dad. Do you know what he said? Mm. I didn't do that. I'm like, what? I didn't, you know, there's a video, bro. Like, that was my you, twin brother. <laughs> yeah, right. But, but see, and here's the thing about somebody who's a narcissist or who's an emotional abuser, their denial internally for them is so good. They believe their own lies. That's why that guy could look at that video and look us in the eyes, look us in the eyes and say, I didn't do that with conviction. And so for a second, you're like, what? Maybe he didn't, you know, but clearly you did. So that level of denial is very confusing, particularly if you have a, a bunch of people around you that are wanting you to stay. What are you going to do? Right. So the one road is you stay in a relationship where you die the death of a thousand cuts or you walk through the gauntlet of pain and grief and get to freedom. Yeah. Neither choice is really all the exciting. <laughs> but I can tell you the choice of walking through the gauntlet gives you options. Staying in a destructive relationship, I can guarantee the outcome. Mm -hmm. It won't be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things I've heard you say is avoidance of the issue will never lead to intimacy bingo and that's what people do i i it, in my book i call it giving cpr to the dead guy yeah you're just giving all this effort but that that person's dead that relationship is dead it's yeah. not coming back no and so you got to like, grieve the death and move on or grieve the death and hope that something new comes but with somebody if you're in a relationship with somebody who has that much internal denial, and I say this all the time, people who are highly abusive, they believe their own lies. Their denial is what I call malignant. It's so thick. It's so intact. It's going to cause death relationally. Yeah. If that's the truth with somebody, you recognizing that is your ticket out. But you are not, and I repeat, you are not going to be able to fix it. Yeah no matter how much effort and the thousands of women i've talked to if effort was going to change it they'd all be living in utopia with the amount of effort that they put in so true. but it was effort that landed nowhere it just exhausted them mm -hmm. so somebody with, somebody with that kind of denial is not going to change yeah or if they did it would take a long time <laughs> It's not yes. right here's now. the other thing. Here's the other thing I see all the time in emotional abuse relationships. The, the person who's being abused sets a boundary, gets clear, gets some therapy, gets in a program like PTH, whatever. And they start, you know, getting clear and setting boundaries. Well, then the person that's harming them has an epiphany. And now they're going to be the man you always wanted them to be. They're reading the Bible. They're going to church. They're going to therapy. And they start using all this different language. And they're like, ah. and they say, I've changed and I'm going to listen. No one changes instantaneously. I know the church teaches this, yeah. but it is a lie. All you gotta do is take one gander at nature. Nothing yeah. changes no. overnight. Well, that's the beauty of the process. Yes. You know, of change, of yes. the seasons, you know. It was, if somebody says they have an epiphany and they're all different within a day, don't believe them. <laughs> yeah. You gotta see that over time. Your change has to be vetted over, over time. So that's I tell people all the time, change has to be consistent behavioral and over a long period of time mm -hmm. that's the only way to rebuild emotional trust mm -hmm. interesting 
uh, something I came across of meaning to mention to you actually okay. is a guy on YouTube who has a pretty good following right now. He calls himself a recovering narcissist. Uh huh. And what he does is he uh, gives tips on how to co-parent with the narcissist. He says what he used to do and what you would need to do now. And I was, as I was watching these videos, I was like, oh my gosh, like he's learned all of these tactics and what to say, because this material is out everywhere now. Yeah. Like it mm-hmm. is a bit of a movement, this whole narcissism oh, and totally. emotional abuse yeah. stuff. Yeah. He's making a living off of being a recovery, recovered narcissist. But, you know, we've worked with them <laughs> enough that I was like, this guy, he's a little like fishy to me. So yeah. anyways, I thought that was interesting. Curious on your thoughts on that, because you said they don't just change. Like mm-hmm. they call yourself a recovering narcissist and then tr- making a living on helping people by saying what you're doing wrong. Yeah. But it was just so like um, scripted. I guess yes. I could say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, so. and see, I don't know anything about the guy. I never heard of the guy. Never yeah. watched any of his videos. So I don't know. But yeah. in principle, yes. uh, for a narcissist to, to change is a very difficult task. And again, it's it, I say this all the time. It's not that change isn't possible because change is possible. But it's highly improbable yeah. because of the level of denial the person possesses. Yeah. So if someone has that level of denial, how is anything going to change? Because they don't take responsibility for anything. Right. They turn it all into somebody else's fault. So we're talking about some behaviors here with the abusers. One Mm -hmm. is they don't take responsibility Mm -hmm. to high levels of denial. They're lying to themselves. They're lying to everybody else around them. And then, well, one thing I just brought up is they do learn tactics Mm-hmm. They change tactics, change tactics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like they'll be confrontive and harsh and all that. And then you set a boundary and then they become Christian and then they start using Bible language and they start using Bible terms and verses to manipulate you into submission and or they become therapized and they start using therapy words and they get what I call psychologically sophisticated and they start manipulating. But all of that is show if there's no actual ownership of behavior. And here's the other thing. If someone does not have ownership from within them, the motive is in them, it's not external. It's not you twisting their arm. It's not you setting another boundary. It's not their job firing them. It's not whatever. If they internally have their own desire to change and you don't have to lead them by the hand or lead them by the nose and show them everything they need to do, if they're doing it on their own, now that has some teeth to it. That means there's some process happening in them because somebody isn't showing them how to do it. And so I hear this all the time in relationships. The narcissist says to the spouse or the girlfriend or whatever, hey, will you just tell me what I need to do? Don't do it. Don't mm-hmm. tell them what they need to do. Yes. Because if you do and then they do it, why are they doing it? Because you told them. What you need to see is them being able to go, oh, I see that you're hurting. Well, I'm going to do something different. And they have their own internal motive, which means their denial doesn't exist in the way that it did before. And so without that internal motive, you're just going to you're going to be taking shots of hope and you're going to be on the narcissistic merry-go-round. Yeah. And then, you know, five years later, you're strung out again. Yes. Well, and the other thing I noticed in the genuine, I guess you could call it conviction in that person that's mm-hmm. harming someone is not yeah. only do they see that they harm the other person and so they want to change for them, but they also just want to change because they don't like who they are and, and th- how that affects their character, who they are. They're like, this isn't Bingo. who I am. This isn't who I want to be. So it's mm-hmm. like, they're doing it for themselves too, not just for mm-hmm. the other person. I've that's noticed. exactly right. Right. Yeah. But in that process, they see what they're doing to the other person without somebody writing it down for them. Exactly. Which means yeah. you don't have denial and you have your, the ability to empathize with another person, which denial takes away from you. Mm-hmm. So we talk about narcissists as people who can't empathize. But narcissism to me is just another term for epic levels of denial. Mm. That's what leads somebody to that place. You can deny anything. You can rationalize anything. Yeah. And when you're around somebody like that, don't give them any information. Don't open up to them. Don't be vulnerable because it's they're, 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 all they're going to do is take information. Information to an abuser is ammunition. Yeah. 
So you have to be very careful about that once you recognize that. And what I see all the time is women trying so hard and they're giving all this information, they're giving up themselves and they're, you know, doing all this stuff. And the other person is just taking, 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 and then slapping you back, taking, taking, and then slapping you back, undermining you, gaslighting you, whatever. And so that's that there's only that the only way that ends is badly yeah and so what i'm trying to do is help people get that and then navigate that healthily for them mm-hmm. we're not going to worry about that person we're going to make sure we're taking care of ourselves because a well us is the best gift we can give our kids a well us is the best gift we can give our spouse yeah but not if that spouse is undermining and destroying us right. and i hear it all the time well, I, I took a vow and I take my vow seriously and I'm going to stay. Mm-hmm. Well, you didn't take a vow to stay. You took a vow to love. Mm-hmm. If that's not happening in the relationship, it doesn't exist. And I tell you, I have talked to thousands of people who are in marriages what I would call divorced living is married. There's no connection. There's no intimacy. Or if there is physical intimacy, it's painful for the woman uh there's no emotional trust there's no emotional connection there's very little conversations and i've talked to people who have lived in separate rooms sexless for decades i'm like we're staying for what because none of that has any semblance of what marriage is supposed to be so what are we staying for i think we're staying out of fear i think we're staying out of religious guilt i think we're staying out of no good the reasons aren't good So when your marriage is that dead, I don't believe God's in heaven going, oh, God, I'm so glad you're staying. He's like, no, your your marriage is killing you. Please get out. Let me help you. I don't want you dying. I don't want you being emotionally destroyed. I don't want you being horribly depressed and overwhelmed and exhausted from the marriage. No, it should be a source of life. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And, And so that's another meta in our culture, particularly the Christian culture, that's really problematic. Mm-hmm. that I, I disagree with, although I taught it for years. I see both sides now. I see the damage of it. Yeah. And so I understand why guys, pastors, and religious people go down that road. It's just uninformed and uh, a lie from my perspective. So uh, that's another problem that I see women deal with all the time because their faith communities turn against them when they start getting honest. Wow. So yeah. they got a double hurdle. Double divorce in a lot of ways. It is it's exactly what happens. And no, most most people didn't see that coming. No, I didn't. <laughs> it was like. You thought they were going to surround you. They would have warned me on that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me, but I, yeah. They're going to surround you and help you and be warm and kind. And, yeah. But it also, <laughs> I noticed in that process, it revealed, or it, um, although it was double divorce, it was, uh, it created room for healthier people to come in. And that's. And that's, that's the that's very hope that. yeah. unpleasant reality, yes. but it's very necessary for that to happen because once you start to see where toxic's at and you start to understand toxicity and unhealthiness and selfishness and denial, once you start to see that stuff, you're like, oh no, it's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause, yeah, cause it is. See it. Yeah. And you can't unsee it. I don't think so either. Mm-mm. Well, thank you for just your insights and your sure. experience and all of that. Yeah. Um, so if somebody who's maybe watching this for the first time, um, yeah. has never heard of you, has never really heard of emotional abuse, and they're like, eek, I think mm-hmm. I'm I think he's speaking to me. Like, mm-hmm. where would you send them next? What would be- I would I would encourage you to go to my website, patrickdoyle.life, and check out Pathway to Hope. Um, it's designed specifically for people who are in any stage of that. And yeah, I yeah. take people through a course of videos um, from the very beginning, telling my story about abuse and how I, what, what I went through. And then all of the steps that I've been teaching people for, for the years from identification to acceptance, to grieving it, to getting out, to living free. Um, and wherever you're at in that process, um, Uh, And, but more importantly than all the information that I give in the course, it's the community. It's all the women in the forums that are sharing back and forth and providing support. I also do some Q and A's twice a month 
and I have a bunch of conversations that matters where I, I interview women who have been in the process. They talk about their story. I interview Dr. Henry Cloud and uh, other people in, in there. So there's lots of information, but, but equal to that and probably more important is the community and the safety that any time of day, any time of night, you can sit down and you can type in something in the forums and then you're going to get responses and you're going to get community from that. So you don't feel alone. Feeling alone is one of the biggest hurdles I've seen to women because they don't have any resources. When you're already exhausted, you don't have the energy for the fight. When you start getting into the forms, you start seeing other people, you start getting validated. It starts to give you a little life. So that would be the first place I would, I would suggest they go um, and um, see what they think. And maybe it'll help. Um, but that's why I designed it. So, and you know from experience and managing the community, Amber, how how uh, impactful that has been. It really has. It's really it's really amazing to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, in the comments below, um, put the link to the your website, and then also yeah. to the Pathway to Hope page and uh, email if you have any questions at info at patrickdoyle.life. Awesome. Thanks again for uh, being with me and managing the community, Amber. I appreciate it. And we'll look forward to seeing everybody on the next Patrick Dollar Show. Thank you.